personally want to thank all of our candidates in attendance and all of our uh, residents here today and elected officials for joining us today in this debate. Thank you. One of those buttons has to work. There we go. Okay. Welcome to the Nassau County Village Officials Association. Meet the candidates for county exec debate. My name is Robert Kennedy. I'm the mayor of the village of Freeport. and I'm also the president of the Nassau County Village Officials Association. Before we start, I'll ask everybody to please stand and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. Hand over heart. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. The Nassau County Village Officials Association, or the NCVOA, is a nonprofit organization which represents 64 villages in Nassau County, with a combined population of 450,000 people. Among other activities, it advocates for, educates, encourages, and cooperation among, and provides a medium for all village officials to exchange ideas and experiences. The NCVOA villages constitute 10% of the villages in New York State and 20% of the population of state villages. In fact, two of the villages are the two largest villages in New York State and larger than 50 cities. Here we are today with our Democratic and Republican candidates for county exec who are going to articulate their goals and positions in answering and debating the number of questions posed to them by our moderator, Judge A. Gail Prudente. Judge Gail Prudente is the Dean of Hofstra Law School and Executive Director of Hofstra Center for Children, Families, and Law. Prior to that, she was a well-respected jurist for over two decades. She served as Chief Administrative, Administrative Judge for the Courts of New York State, Presiding Judge of the Appellate Division Second Department, Associate Judge of that department, Surrogate Judge, Supreme Court Judge, and that's only part of the many accomplishments of our judge. Before I turn over the forum to our moderator, I want to thank LIU Post for this fabulous room and all they did for us in coordinating this. The Great Neck North Shore Public Access TV for streaming this debate live and offering a recorded version online for viewing for those who are not able to attend this debate tonight. I also want to thank our executive directors, Warren Tackenberg and Ralph Kreisman, for organizing this event and also want to mention Connoisseur Media, who is KJOY, who is repeating this Sunday night, as well as live right now. So without further ado, I now uh, introduce you to our moderator, Judge Prudenti. Please. Thank you so much, Mayor Kennedy. It is my pleasure to preside over these proceedings and tonight's debate. While you may know our candidates, let me provide an introduction and some information on each of them. The information has been provided by the candidates themselves. Let me start with Laura Curran. Laura Curran lives in Baldwin, and I would like to add my husband grew up in oh, Baldwin. That's great. And she is serving her second term in the Nassau County Legislature. Ms. Kern moved to Baldwin in 1997 with her husband, where they now live with their three daughters. She received her bachelor's degree in humanities from Sarah Lawrence College and did some graduate work in American studies at the CUNY Graduate School. She's a former reporter for the New York Daily News and the New York Post. She later worked part-time in the press office of the former Democratic Nassau County Executive Thomas Swazi, now a congressman in the third district. Ms. Kern was elected to the Baldwin School Board in 2010 and served one term before joining the legislature. As a legislator, Ms. Kern spearheaded efforts to waive rebuilding fees for Sandy victims help veteran-owned businesses win county contracts, and establish a land bank 
to rid our communities of blighted zombie homes. She's running for county executive because as a legislator, she has had a front row seat and in her view has viewed the corruption, the dysfunction and the mismanagement in county government. And she's got a plan to fix it. Ms. Kearns already rolled out real estate reforms to end the culture of corruption and give Nassau County the fresh start that it deserves. She's also got a vision to help Nassau County grow for the future by, by attracting new residents and businesses to expand the tax base. Jack Martins is the Republican, conservative, and Reform Party nominee for Nassau County Executive. Mr. Martins is a former three-term New York State Senator, the former mayor of Mineola, and lives in Nassau County with his wife and four daughters. He is focused on making Nassau County a better place to live, work, and raise a family. As Nassau County Executive, Mr. Martins is committed to ending the corruption that he views has compromised the public's trust in government, protecting local property taxpayers, and creating an economic renaissance to provide a brighter future for the middle class. As mayor of Mineola, Mr. Martins developed balanced, physically responsible budgets and debt management plans that substantially reduced Mineola's debt and returned the village to a sound financial footing. He also led the effort to create Mineola's award-winning master redevelopment plan that expanded the village's economic base through smart growth principles. As a state senator, Mr. Martins enacted an historic series of balanced, on-time state budgets while cutting state taxes on middle-class families to the lowest level in 50 years and delivering record state funding for Nassau County schools. So now, here are the rules for the debate, which has been agreed upon by both candidates. Each candidate will be allowed three minutes for an opening statement. The candidates will alternate in answering each question first, and each will have three minutes to answer. One rebuttal by the first candidate to answer of up to one and one and a half minutes will be permitted. The order for the candidates to give their opening statements was determined by a coin toss prior to this debate. The winner of the coin toss had the option to speak first or second. Mr. Martins won the toss and chose to speak last. The order of the closing statements will be in reverse of the opening statements. Each candidate will have three minutes to make closing remarks. The timekeepers for this forum are Warren Trachtenberg and Ralph Kreitzman, co-executive directors of the Nassau County Villages Officials Association. A timekeeper will announce when there are 15 seconds left in the question period and the end of the period, a timekeeper will announce that time has expired. So now, I would ask Ms. Curran if she will please offer her opening statement and please limit it to three minutes. Thank you very much, Judge Prudenti. And thank you, NCVOA, for having us this evening. And thanks to all of you for taking time out of your Tuesday night to come and spend some time with us and get to know your candidates. Um, I want to just start by saying that I have the utmost respect for our villages. I rep currently represent a district on the South Shore that has two fantastic mayors, and I'm not just saying that because one of them is here. There is a Democrat, Robert Kennedy, and a Republican, Fran Murray, and they both run their budgets, manage their budgets really well. They manage their, their villages really well. I have a lot of respect for them, and I have an excellent working relationship with both of them. And frankly, I need more. I think we need more of that. We have a patchwork quilt of municipalities and we have many common needs and we really be, need to be able to work together and to have a good relationship despite party, despite municipal lines. 
So just to tell you a little bit about myself, Judge Prudenti touched on some of this. I am not a career politician. I have a background as a newspaper reporter, and I got into public service through my kids. I've got three girls. Jax has four, so he's won me on, he's beat me on that. <laughs> And I wanted to do what I could, they're in the public schools where I live in Baldwin, I wanted to do what I could to help our school succeed and to help my community succeed, so I ran for my local school board. And I loved it. Uh, you know, we were managing a $120 million a year budget. At the end of my term, I was president of the school board. And it really just sparked my interest to step up and serve my community in a bigger way. And I had the opportunity to run for county legislator. And as a legislator over the past four years, I'm very proud of the reputation that I've carved out as someone who puts her constituents first. And I'm not afraid to cross party lines when it's doing the right thing for the people that I represent. I, I truly see this job as being a public servant, that we are here to serve the public. But I don't, I don't want to sugarcoat it. You know, as a county legislator, for almost four years, I have had a front row seat to a lot of dysfunction, mismanagement, and frankly, corruption. And you don't have to be a county legislator to know what I'm talking about. You, when you see elected officials such as Mangano and Skelos and Vendito being carted off in handcuffs, you know something is not right. And frankly, it's not a partisan issue. You also have Corbin and Williams and others on the other side of the aisle. The fact is, the system is broken. And we've got serious problems in Nassau County. We have unbalanced budgets. We're under a control period of a control board that is unelected. We're lacking a vision, an overall arching vision of how we grow, how we grow the economy, how we grow the tax base. But before we can truly tackle those problems, we've got to get buy-in from you, from the town supervisors, from Albany, from Washington, from our constituents. And how are we going to get buy-in if we don't have trust? So when I'm county executive, I will put safeguards in place, and I'm sure we'll be talking about this more as the evening goes on, safeguards in place to stop corruption before it has a chance to start so that we can build the trust and do what it is that we have to do, provide the services that we need to provide, grow the tax base that benefits all of our communities. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Martins, please make your opening statement, and once again, please limit it to three minutes. Thank you, and thank you, Judge Prudenti. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Mayor Kennedy, Mayor Stackenberg, and Mayor Kreitzman as well. Uh, and thank you to the Nassau County Village Officials Association for the opportunity to present this evening. I also want to thank uh, Laura for joining us here this evening for this discussion. Um, we can all go back and think about that moment that we decided to get involved in public service. For many of us, it was in our local villages. For some, it was in a school board. Uh, but the opportunity we saw to actually make a difference and a positive difference. You know, one of the things that strikes me is growing up, my father used to tell me, it is our responsibility to do something about it if we actually feel that there's something that needs to be done. And if we have the ability to do it and we don't, then shame on us. So I go back to my years in Mineola, dating back to 2002, uh, seeing the village in dire financial straits accumulated debt, unbalanced budgets, and we decided to take that challenge and winning for trustee in 2002 and then running and being elected mayor in 2003. And those decisions aren't easy, but they're decisions that need to be made if you're going to make a difference in a positive way. Having been elected in 2003 as a mayor in Mineola, the challenges were significant. The village had $33 million in debt, $22 million in short-term debt. We had no reserves at all and a half million dollar shortfall from the previous year. And I see some people nodding their heads here because you understand what I'm talking about. I won and they said congratulations, but yet those were the challenges. And by the way, they said you have to go to Moody's in two months and roll over your short-term debt into long-term debt and start paying down principal and interest. And that's what we did. We adopted a debt management plan we went at it aggressively. We reviewed our master plan, which hadn't been done in almost 50, 60 years since the end of World War II. We s invested in infrastructure in the village. We rebuilt roads, rebuilt sidewalks, built parks, redid the Mineola Boulevard Bridge, built an intermodal center. In eight years, we were able to turn the village around, working together, the entire board, working with the community, and that's what leadership is about. It's not about wishing to do something. It's not 
about being or ha being in a front row watching dysfunction. It's about being the person that goes out there and takes responsibility for being the change agent that you need at that moment. In 2010, I had the ability and, and the privilege of running for the New York State Senate, won that election, and served three terms in the New York State Senate, where I chaired local governments, dealt with regional issues, was appointed by the governor to the Financial Restructuring Board, which went around after Detroit filed for bankruptcy, preventing our upstate communities from doing the same. Time is up. And so I thank you for that opportunity to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, we are ready for our first question. And our first question I, I will ask uh, to Laura Curran. Laura, county taxpayers pay an enormous amount of money for police protection, as we all know. Yet local villages feel that they receive very little day-to-day -day dedicated personnel. For instance, one village with a population of 10,000 residents has only two patrol cars dedicated to it daily. Similarly, a second village with its own police force and a population of 2,750 has two cars, two cars dedicated to it. As county executive, how would you propose to give county taxpayers more visible police manpower and patrols on the street in each community in a manner that is more cost effective? Also, do you support reopening the 6th Precinct? I'll take the, first, the second question first. Yes, I wholeheartedly support opening the 6th Precinct. If you look at trends nationwide, policing trends, it is towards more granular, smaller, closer to the ground, community-based type policing. More, more precincts, more community policing centers. And the consolidation plan was exactly the wrong way to go. And not only would I look to reopen the 6th and reopen the 6th, I would also look to reopening the 8th precinct. You know, if you don't have public safety, it's a very, it's a very primary function of government to make sure that people are safe. If we don't do that, you know, everything else is gravy. That's the basis of civilization. So we have to make sure that we man all of our communities properly and appropriately. Reopening the 6th Precinct is a huge part of that. And the other thing I would remind you is that the municipal contracts, the, work, the county workers' municipal contracts are up at the end of this year. So it's the next county executive that will be negotiating those contracts. And I know that whoever wins this race, a big part of that negotiation will be minimum manning. Will be, you know, is it necessary to have sector cars in every single community all the time? Or can we give the people who manage the police department a little more flexibility in how they manage their resources? That will be a very important conversation and one that I'm looking forward to having. But yes, reopening the 6th will happen, and I'm very much looking forward to doing that as county executive. Thank you. Jack Barnes? Thank you. Thank you very much. Reopening the 6th and reopening the 8th are critically important. We have to reverse uh, the mistake that was made during this current administration um, and the broken promise that there would be significant savings. You don't put a price tag on public safety. You don't put a price tag on um, the ability of our local police department to provide local services. You know, once upon a time, when I was a mayor of Mineola, um, I did look at the village starting its own police department. And, you know, we went through the process, we scoped it, we priced it out, and ultimately we had a referendum and it lost miserably. It lost two to one. And the numbers were there, but um, the residents of Mineola decided it wasn't for them. So it does come back to understanding how this sector system actually works, realizing that that sector grid that exists out there right now uh, dates back to 1968. We are an entirely different county than we were uh, 50 years ago. And so the opportunity for us to provide that flexibility, um, understanding that because of those requirements, not only um, minimum manning, but also the restrictions that we've had over the years and the reliance on overtime to make up for those restrictions means that we have to look at being more creative in terms of providing personnel, providing flexibility, uh, something that unfortunately is lost when you're simply looking at full-time employees for the purposes of providing coverage. So whether we're paying overtime at time and a half plus all the benefits that go along with it, um, it is 
I think, far more intelligent for us to take the opportunity to cut back on the overtime, provide full-time employees, allow people to come through the academy, make those decisions today. Um, notwithstanding the fact that we do have a large number of our police department actually aging out, um, it is our responsibility to make sure that that institutional knowledge stays there, and so that means recruiting more people, bringing them in, and providing flexibility. I know what that frustration is. I know all too well that in Mineola, for example, uh, more often than not, our cars were outside of Mineola responding to emergencies. And when there was an emergency in Mineola, those cars would be there as well. But providing flexibility for the inspectors and the precincts and for the commissioner to be able to deploy personnel is important. I'll take one additional step with regard to uh, providing uh, an extra person inside county ambulances to be able to drive so that our police officers can actually stay right where they are. So for our villages that have their own police department, they can keep their police officers in their villages. For those who do not, there'll be someone there who's driving people around and they'll have the opportunity to leave the officer where he is and still get the person to, to the hospital. Something we should look into. Thank you. Thank you. Any rebuttal? I would also just add, it's not really a rebuttal, but I would add that the overtime savings that were promised with the consolidation of precincts did not materialize. In fact, the savings that were promised did not materialize at all, and overtime actually went up. Overtime is budgeted at a certain amount every year. Under this administration, overtime has far exceeded what it was budgeted. That's not responsible budgeting. The current, the guy who was just appointed as the acting commissioner, the current acting police commissioner, is starting to take that under control, bring it down again, and that's something I'm really looking forward to seeing through as county executive, continuing that trend. Thank you. Let's talk a little bit about county finances. Uh, Jack, this, is for you, this question is for you to start. Nassau County's finances really do appear to residents to be broken, or at least in dire, dire shape, with oversight now by NIFA and annual deficits. Critics have said that the Nassau County budget process is broken and it is purely smoke and mirrors. What concrete steps would you take as county executive to fix the county's budget woes? Thank you. You know, we as a county, all of us participate in this process, have a $3 billion budget in Nassau County. And for the $3 billion that are spent out there, you have to actually start looking at how that breaks out. So let's look at the revenue side of it, $900 million or so from property taxes, 1.2 or $1.3 billion from sales tax revenue and then the others are ancillary fees and some money that comes in from the federal government. Uh, nearly $3 billion. Out of that, on the expense side, about a billion dollars or so is payroll. The additional benefits to go along with payroll, about $300 million or so. Overtime is about $120 or $125 million. So going back, and you look at where the discretionary spending is, where the opportunities are, for flexibility, one of the areas we do have to look at is, frankly, that overtime number. The idea that you have literally more than 10% of your payroll committed to overtime means that something's wrong. Having reviewed and administered um, a municipality back in our time as mayor, you understand that overtime is not how you generate your, your services. Your services are provided by your Resident, your, your employees working their normal hours. The overtime is there in the event of an emergency, whether that emergency happens sporadically, it could be a natural disaster, it could be any number of things, but you're prepared for that in your contingency. $125 million, if we just cut overtime by 50%, you save $60 million. You do away with the fee increases and in all the proposals they have today. Taking an additional step, understanding, again, I haven't been in county government. I haven't been there for the last four years. Certainly, I haven't been part of this review. But in the time that I've reviewed this budget, reviewed departments, the fact that we're still using technology from the late 1980s and early 1990s, the fact that we're still doing things with pad and paper, and we haven't upgraded to the, the 21st century, even the latter part of the 20th century, should be disturbing to everyone in the room. We are one of the most affluent, most well-educated counties in the entire country. And yet we are limited in our way that we provide our resources, the way we provide services, because we have not caught up. 
And so the challenge for the next county executive is going to be not only dealing administratively with this overtime issue, which I have done in the past, but also looking structurally at this county and looking for ways to actually bring these things together. If anything, they've wasted money, I think close to $20, $25 million implementing a system over the last four years that still has not been implemented. And so that is the challenge, and that's what I'm committed to fixing. Thank you. Laura? It is frankly an embarrassment that a county as great as Nassau and as many resources as we have is under a control board, under a control period of that control board. That's an embarrassment. So how do we fix it? First, number one, our, as, as Jack pointed out, a third of our budget is payroll. The municipal contracts are up at the end of this year. So we have to negotiate fair contracts for our workers, also a fair deal for the taxpayers who pay for the work of government. Also, this current administration spends millions upon millions of dollars in outside contracts, often to legally connected law firms, construction firms, et cetera. We can bring a lot of that work in-house and begin saving money immediately. We might need to hire a few more attorneys for the county attorney's office, but at the end of the day, we'll save a lot of money. And of course, it's inevitable that we're going to have to outsource some work. So when we do contracting, when we do hire vendors, let's manage those contracts responsibly. And I'll just give you one glaring example of how this has not happened. So the county outsourced health care at the jail. One of our responsibilities is the jail. And they contracted to a company called Armor and paid them for five years, $60 million, $12 million a year, but were not making sure that the county, that the Armor, that the provider, was meeting very simple metrics, requirements that were supposed to be regularly reported. And then what happened? The health care was substandard. The attorney general launched an investigation. The county is now getting sued by inmates' families who have died because of that lack of management. So when we do outsource, when we're spending your money for services, we have to make sure that we manage those like it was our own money, incredibly responsibly. We also have to get rid of what I call the corruption tax for those no-show jobs, for those bloated contracts given out to sweethearts. And trust me, they're there. I talked to a guy just the other day from the South Shore, a politically connected guy who quit the county because his job was basically to sit in a room in a small building at Nickerson Beach and do nothing and report to no one. Why is that happening? We've got to go through every position, make sure they're doing the actual work of government, and if they're not, either reassign them or get rid of them because it's your money that's being wasted when that happens. On the other side, we've also got to grow the tax base, and that's where you come in. Our the revenue that we get into the county, the revenue portion of the budget, 40% of that is from sales tax. So we've got to welcome business with open arms. We've got to create an environment that makes it welcoming for business, whether it's through IDA, whether it's doing transit-oriented development, et cetera. But we, we're going to need your help with that. We're going to need your partnership with that. When we grow the tax base, when we can keep our young people, when we can make real thriving downtowns, that will attract businesses. It will grow the tax base. We can also use our IDA to make it much more muscular and really bargain good deals for the taxpayers that will grow, create the jobs, that will, that will grow the tax base. That's how we grow, that's how we grow the tax base, and that's how we live up to our potential. Jack, any additional comments? Sure, thank you. You know, um, as I mentioned earlier, I'm not the one who was in the county for the past four years, and so as we identify the concerns and the challenges that the county has, I agree. You know, when I look at the challenges and the, con and the, and the, the um, frankly, the mismanagement over the past four years, I'm concerned about the fact that we're sitting here pointing at them because we can all, every one of us here in the room, point to each and every one of these. But the fact that nothing has been done over those four years to actually address the concerns that we're talking about here when there are only 19 people in the entire county who have the ability to actually affect policy in this county um, is a shame. You know, I agree that having NIFA here has been an absolute uh, disgrace for 17 years. The fact that the county has not been able to balance its budget, Democrats and Republicans have not had the courage to actually address this issue, and it has to be done once and for all. But let's understand something. It's going to happen. We're going to bring the county's budget balanced. We're going to make sure that NIFA is gone within two years, at least out of its control period, 
then I'd like to also refinance its debt and see it gone altogether. If we can do it dollar for dollar and not at the expense of our tax base. But it's time this county started making decisions for itself. It's time this county thought big again and set its priorities for itself and not by somebody dictating from Albany. Thank you. Thank you. Nassau County has 64 incorporated villages which represent 450,000 of Nassau's 1.3 million residents. Villages often require the assistance of, as we all know, and the coordination with the county and its departments to provide services to their residents. Many villages have found that communication and response times between the county and local municipalities has deteriorated over the last 10 to 15 years from what it was in the past decades, resulting in a diminution of the quality of life in our communities. Laura, what is your vision as county executive for improving response times and the level of cooperation and communication among the county and its departments and the villages? Yes, I know exactly what you're talking about. Uh, I hear it from my, the mayors in my district. I hear it that they're frustrated, and I try to help them, and I have been successful in helping them as much as I can, whether it's getting some, something simple like the, you know, the storm drains cleared or having, you know, there's money that's been set aside. For instance, in the village of Freeport, there was money that was set aside for a project. I think it was close to $5 million, and nothing was done until I got their DPW guys and our DPW guys together in the room. They hashed it out. Fast forward, it worked. That level of service, I mean, as, when I say we're in the customer service business here in the government, it's not just to the constituents, it's also to the supervisors and to the mayors with whom we work. Because we are a community of communities here in Nassau County. Every village, every town, every hamlet has its own distinct personality, its own distinct needs, sometimes its own distinct accent. We're very particular. And we've got to be able to recognize that if you live in a village, which is within a town, which is within a county, that's three levels of municipal government sometimes that constituents have to wade through and mayors and village officials have to wade through, and it's very confusing. So it comes down to having a level of respect for you. It comes down to building good relationships with you, despite party. It also comes down to having, res having enough respect that I take your needs as seriously as my own, because guess what? It's all the same constituents. That constituent of a village, of a town, of, a, of our county, are all the same people. So we have to make sure that we're true diplomats and that we set the tone from the top to all of our department heads that they are accountable to you. And I will ensure that that happens. I find a large part of my job as a legislator is helping village officials, town officials, and constituents navigate it all, find the right people to talk to. And something I'm very committed to making happen because if you succeed, we succeed. It's all the same people. Thank you. And Jack, what is your vision for Thank improving you. response times and the level of cooperation? I appreciate the question. You know, as a, as a former mayor, um, as someone who has worked um, with so many of my colleagues and shared best practices over the years, um, that, is, that is what is, frankly, essential. You know, our mayors are part-time. Uh, officers, for the most part, I think almost everyone is. And I used to say that being a mayor was the best 70-hour-a-week part-time job I ever had. <laughs> it, it's about working together. It's about understanding that we are all, for the most part, similarly situated in the ability of us to learn from each other and work together. And that happened for me when I was you know, first elected with guys like Gene Murray in Rockville Center or Ernie Strada in Westbury or Andy Parisi in Cedarhurst, people who were here for years and sort of took us under their wings and showed us how to get things done and people we could call on for, for advice. We see that today. You know, when I was elected to the Senate, I, I had the privilege of chairing the Senate Standing Committee on Local Governments. And so as the Senate Chair for Local Governments, I dealt with all of the villages, all of the towns, all of the counties throughout New York State. I also had the distinction of having the most villages of any senator in the entire state in my district. I had 32 villages. And so working with those 32, fully half of the villages in Nassau County were in my Senate district, working hand in hand, meeting those challenges and making sure that we had the opportunity to work together as well. 
the idea is we should work together. We need to. And so whether it's infrastructure improvements, whether it's roadway improvements in particular, whether it's sewer improvements, I mean, we look at challenges like the villages of, village of Seacliff that wants to and needs to tie into the county sewer system, and yet the project is being held up for the lack of one single vote from a Democrat in the county legislature to actually approve the bonds necessary to get that going. You know, you look at roads in our villages that are county roads that haven't been paved for the sake of someone playing politics with that one single vote from a Democrat on the county legislature because you need 13 votes to actually approve a bond to do the infrastructure improvement, and yet there are 12 Republicans and seven Democrats, and if just one person, Laura included, voted for it, we'd get these projects done. We have to stop playing politics and partisan politics. We have to put that aside and put the best interest of the residents of this county first, and that is the residents in our villages, the residents in our towns, because we're all county residents when it all comes down to it, and leadership means not playing partisan politics. It means leading, and actually, and actually, it means finding results. Thank you. Crossing that divide, and that's what I'm committed to do. It's what I've done my entire time in public service. Thank, Thank you. you. And Laura, any additional comments? Sure, I have provided that one vote at times when I thought it was appropriate. I actually got in trouble with my own party a couple of times for doing that. I would do it again because it's the right thing to do for the people that I represent. However, I will not give this administration, especially after the Abtec Skello scandal, a blank check if I'm not absolutely 100% sure that that money is going to be spent responsibly. But I have broken ranks to improve the, uh, increase the amount of buses that Nice Bus provides for our routes, to do structural improvements to the community college, to pave roads, and also to do traffic safety, light, you know, traffic light improvements. That is something I'm very proud of, and also anything having to do with public safety, Absolutely, we have to do it. But if I'm not 100% sure that that money being bonded is being spent for the project, it's, the administration says it's going to be bonded for and spent appropriately, I'm not gonna give them that blank check, not under these circumstances. Thank you. Now let's speak about the Nassau County's assessment and tax refund system that has left it more than a billion dollars in debt and taxpayers with similar properties paying significantly different real estate property taxes. It is imperative that this assessment system be corrected so that the disparities among communities and individual taxpayers can and should have confidence and fairness restored to this system. Jack, how do you propose to finally and definitively fix the county assessment system, and what structural changes are you poised to make to prevent the problem from reoccurring in the future? Th thank you, Judge. You know, there's nothing more important right now to restoring trust in county government than getting this assessment system right. The one thing we hate more as taxpayers than paying taxes themselves is realizing that we're paying more than we should and our neighbors are perhaps paying less. This tax system is, um, is a countywide system. There are 62, village, 62 counties in New York State, 57 outside of New York City. All but two of them have a town-based assessment system. The only two are Nassau County and Tompkins County in upstate New York. So the large suburban counties in this state all have town-based systems. We have more challenges to our assessment system in Nassau County than the entire rest of the state combined. And that assessment system that we have in place right now, verifiable, disproportionately affects socioeconomically challenged areas for the benefit of others. And so let's look at best practices, let's look at what's working out there, and what I've proposed is transferring the assessment function from the county to the towns. Now I had the opportunity as mayor to reassess my village. People said it was political suicide, you shouldn't do it, people are gonna get upset, don't touch it because if, it's, if you do anything, they're gonna blame you if their taxes go up. But we did it. And in doing it, we cut our certiorari's from 1.3 million to $300,000. We paid $300,000 
just three years after we reassessed the village because of the amount of CERT payouts that were in the pipeline. That's against a $12 million budget. So understanding that, it is critically important that we understand that it is our responsibility to get proper assessments. It's also critically important that we understand that scale matters and that the smaller the assessing unit, the more accurate it's going to be. You look at the county today, the two cities, Glen Cove and Long Beach, have their own assessment system. The county doesn't assess for them and they don't have the same challenges and the same cert issues that we have in this county. So let's pull back, let's understand that but for a state law, we would not have county-based assessment, we would have town-based assessment. Let's understand that the towns in Suffolk and the towns in Westchester are doing a far better job than we're doing here in Nassau County and that's borne out. Let's transfer it to them, let's provide the, the savings to the county, by the way, is somewhere in the area of 80 to 100 million dollars against the $900 million tax base. And so the savings is real to each and every taxpayer in the county. And let's take some of that savings and let's give it to our town so that they can transfer the assessment function from the county to the towns. It's a win, win, win. The taxpayers are the same. We have a better system and the system actually works. We've seen that it can happen on a village level. Let's replicate it and make sure that we can do it on a town level as well. Thank you. Thank you. And Laura, how do you propose to finally and definitively fix the county assessment system? So first to the proposal of transferring assessment to the towns. This is an idea that it was floated four years ago by the current county executive and it went over like a lead balloon because frankly the towns don't want it in the current state that it is in. And perhaps, you know, we can talk to our, our state legislators, maybe if they're open to it, that would, be, that would be good. However, I don't think the towns are going to want it unless we get the assessments right and fix it. So how did we get in the mess that we're in now? Currently, our assessments have been frozen. They've been frozen for eight years. At the same time as this has happened, we do not have an actual credential qualified assessor, which state law in our charter mandates that we hired a credentialed assessor. For whatever reason, no one's been bothered to hire, to find this person and hire this person for the past seven years. So you don't have, the, you don't have a good person managing the department. At the same time as that, the department has been cut literally in half. The manpower has been cut in half over the past eight years. So you don't have the people doing the work of assessment. And then at the same time as that, the assessments have been frozen. And in the meantime, 70, actually it's 80% of property owners have grieved their assessment. Of those, 70% have gotten some kind of reduction. And that's why you see this incredibly unfair shift. The assessments are inaccurate. 15 seconds. And they're unfairly distributed. So we've got to make sure we hired a credential assessor, staff the office appropriately, and redo the assessments. The goal should be at least once a year, if not that, at least every three years to make sure they're fair and they're accurate. When we get our house in order, then perhaps we can have a conversation with the towns to take it over. Thank you. Jack? Thank you. You know, it's, it's sad, but again, um, if there was an issue with the assessor these past four years, I wish we would have heard about it before we actually got here. If there was an issue with this assessment, I would love to have seen a plan ahead of time, but here we are. Ladies and gentlemen, the issue here is that we have to follow best practices. We can't wait for two, three, four, five years for this to sort of fix itself. The work that's being done in the assessment office right now is only going to affect the county's role two years from now in 2020. That is unique to Nassau County. The entire system is broken and you can't fix it simply by tiptoeing around the issue. Yes, we're going to hire somebody who has all of the credentials necessary for assessor, but we also have to understand that everyone else is getting it right simply by virtue of the fact that they don't have the system imploding like we do. And the only difference is that we have a countywide system. It's time we understood that it's our responsibility to fix this and stop pushing the can down the road. When I'm elected county executive, we're gonna fix it. We're going to work with our towns, but frankly, I know they don't want it. I know they don't want the additional responsibility, but every other town in this state takes it, and these towns in our county are going to do the right thing by the taxpayers of our county, because that's what leadership is about. Thank you. Thank you. Now let's discuss some sales taxes. Local residents and merchants and businesses are the primary generators of sales tax revenue in the county. Yet villages 
previously received only a token portion of that revenue and this year received nothing. Nassau cities and towns, however, are required by state law to receive a substantial portion of sales tax receipts. Also, in many of the counties of this state, villages receive a substantial portion of the sales taxes generated within their borders. As county executive, Laura, would you support a change in the state law to require the same amount the county shares with its towns and cities to be shared with its villages? Absolutely, yes, that's an easy one. Um, you know, what happened was, I think the language was changed in the law that said they, they will receive it to, and this is in the county level now, not the state level, that they may receive it, so leaving it up to the county. I think that you deserve your fair share of sales tax, especially from the businesses that are in your districts. You create an environment that welcomes business, you should reap the rewards of that and get your fair share. Now, NIFA, in the, this current year, because our, the financial house of the, the county was not under control, it was a mess, they did away with it for this year. I think that's wrong. It's in the budget for this coming year, and I think that's right. As county executive, I will make sure that that continues. Thank you. Jack? Thank you. You know, um, you have to go back in history a little bit to find out why Nassau County, once again, is the outlier. And it dates back to the 1970s when um, they made a decision to make Nassau County the outlier. At the time, we had a board of supervisors, and lo and behold, with a board of supervisors that were the three town supervisors and the two city, uh, city manager and the, and the city mayor, um, they decided that they wanted the sales tax revenue to go to them and not to be shared with the villages. And so they went up to Albany and they got the law changed so that Nassau County would have no distribution directly to the villages, which is an outlier from the rest of the state. Much the same thing could be said as to why the county has a countywide assessment system, because at the time we had a board of supervisors and the supervisors decided that they didn't want to do the assessment, irrespective of whether or not it was a more accurate system. They would rather see the county do it, and so they pushed it on to the county. Those days are gone. And our responsibility is to go back and force that change to reflect the fact that we have, a, board, we have a, a county legislature and that if we understand that sales tax was supposed to be shared with municipalities in order to reduce taxes, then it makes sense that the layer of government closest to the people be the ultimate recipient of that sales tax revenue. So right now, our towns are receiving the share of sales tax revenue that belongs to the villages because they receive it on a per capita, per person basis based on the number of people who live in the entire town, irrespective of whether or not they live in a village or not. And so yes, we do need to change the law. Yes, we do need to uh, work together to do that. I've supported that since the days I was a mayor in Mineola. I supported it when I was up in Albany and I am looking forward to as county executive being an advocate for that because it's the right thing to do. Each and every one of our villages should not wait for the county to hand them a check based on whether NIFA allows them to or not. The law should be applied equally to Nassau County as it is in other counties across the state that requires that that layer closest to the people, in this case our villages, receives their fair share amount of, of sales tax as well. And it's distributed not based on the number or the amount of sales tax that's generated in the village, it's distributed based on the number of residents who are in that village, so it's rather simple to calculate. Thank you. I'm committed to getting that done. Thank you. Additional comments, Laura? No, thank you. Very well, and let's go on to the issue of affordable housing. Nassau County is well documented as a region with limited affordable housing options for the middle class, and especially for you know, all the middle class young professionals and many, many others. This has led to the so-called brain drain and flight of young people aged 25 to 34 from Nassau County. Jack, what plan or strategy do you have to address the housing crisis and promote affordable housing options in all communities, not just a few? Thank you. I appreciate that. You know, one, let's understand that we're not going to be able to build density in every community. I think we all agree that our focus needs to be on those 
communities that have active train stations, um, our villages that have active downtowns, and we need to work with our local communities to make that happen. Whether they are hamlets or whether they are villages, um, the, vill the county has to have a regional plan that supports construction of different housing options. Nassau County falls way behind every other suburban county regionally when it comes to the percentage of apartments and condominiums that exist in our, in our county um, and the variety that it provides for that next generation that we want to live here. So your point is, Judge, is very well made, um, but it also means that we don't have the housing stock necessary for our seniors who want to age in place. They want to live in the communities that they helped create. People who have been here for decades and are forced with either having to move out or stay in their home because they have limited options for smaller and, and frankly, uh, 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 either, either apartments or condominiums in downtowns that are readily accessible to transportation and shopping and the like. Um, we did it in Mineola. Through a master plan review, we did that almost 13 years ago working together, bringing all of the stakeholders together, um, we were able to do it, and you see the benefit of that right now. Not only an expanded tax base for the schools and for the village and for the town and for the county, but also the activity that it provides. You know, we've built 600 units of apartments, 10% set aside for affordable senior housing, 10% set aside for affordable next generation housing, that is making a shift in how things um, especially our downtown business community, is, is, is proceeding. So that needs to be replicated in different places. It means working with our local communities to do it. And it also means that the county has to fast track those applications. If there's one thing I hear time and again, is that it's too hard for them to get their approvals through the county. Even when they get their approvals through the villages and through the, the towns, that it takes them at least another year or two years to go through the county approval process. That has to change, that has to be fast-tracked. There's no reason why we aren't moving at a county level simultaneously with our applications at a local level so that those approvals are approved more quickly, we get shovels in the ground, we create the housing stock that we need, and we actually provide the opportunities. We also have to think about creating the economic environment and the jobs that are necessary so that when our kids come back, mine included, when my daughters come back from college, they have a job here that they can find, that they can earn a living and afford to live here and raise their families here as well. Thank you. Thank you. And Laura, what is your plan or strategy for addressing the housing crisis? So I truly believe with every fiber of my being that it is transit-oriented development that will save us as a region. It'll keep our young people, it'll keep our empty nesters, it'll keep the tax base from eroding. And there are some wonderful examples led by mayors. So I know Ralph Ekstrom was here, I don't see him now, but the village of Farmingdale, I did a tour there when the, the development was first, you know, the, the uh, beams were first going into the ground four years ago. For, fast forward four years later, the apartments are built, the downtown is thriving. Out in Suffolk, you've got Paul Pontieri in Patchogue. Again, you know, it's 10 years ago, you would have never believed that this is the case. So it's already happening. Let's build on what's working. I know in Westbury, there's an infusion of cash coming from the state, a grant, and I think there's a lot of opportunity there as well. So when I talk about transit-oriented development, I'm talking about a wide range of housing options. And yes, you're not gonna ram anything down a community's throat that doesn't want it. You've got to get buy-in from the community early. But I, as county executive, I will make sure that the IDA, if they do a deal, if they get a deal from, with a developer to do a housing development, that a certain portion, a nice healthy proportion, will be for affordable housing, veteran housing, et cetera. That's key. Let's not forget the importance of T in TOD, the transit. I was very proud as a legislator. You know, I'm in the minority, so I don't have a lot of power in the legislature. But I was very proud to have crafted a bipartisan solution to restore $3 million in funding to buses to restore 10 routes that were cut. Unfortunately, this has not been a priority. But this is something, as county executive, I will make a priority. Because every dollar spent on buses is exponentially multiplied in terms of e in economic development and economic activity. 
the easier people can get on and off and around the island, especially young people who aren't driving and getting their licenses, they don't want to do it as much as we did when we were kids. That is key to holding on to our young people. And I think that's pretty much it. Obviously, you mayors control the zoning. We're not, if Jack wins or I win, we're not the boss of you, we can't tell you what to do. So again, it comes down to crossing party lines, crossing municipal lines, creating relationships, and getting buy-in from all parties, from all stakeholders, getting buy-in that this is going to benefit all of our constituents, and selfishly, the revenue that we get as well, thanks to the tax base. Jack, any thoughts or comments? Sure, thank you. I, I appreciate the, um, the shout out to, uh, to Ralph, Extra and Mayor, thank you. you there was a shout out to you, you should know that in as the well. Bathroom. <laughs> um, you know, here, here's the thing, you know, we have collectively worked together over the years. There have been best practices that we share with each other and certainly seeing the level of economic development and transit oriented development that has taken place over these last 13, 14 years has been a great testament to the fact that it is our villages that are the great incubators in, um, in, in, in our attempt to actually revamp and really uh, kickstart some of those things that should have been done at a more regional level. Um, you know, certainly, you know, uh, Farmingdale and Westbury and Rockville Center, and we can talk about Glen Cove and all of the others, Mineola stands there as well. And so I'd like to make my commitment that that will continue. I'd also like to talk about uh, the fact that we have a bus system that has a $130 million budget. $66 million comes in subsidies from New York State. 8 million of which we were able to secure just a few years ago because the county wasn't paying its share. Here's the thing. 20 years ago, the county was paying $20 million towards that bus system. Today, it's paying six. The state's paying 66 million. The fare box only brings in 45 to $50 million. It's time the county paid its fair share as opposed to nickel and diming our bus system each and every year. I want to see a commitment from our legislature and from our county executive. Thank you. Thank you. As we all know, Nassau County officials have not been immune to serious ethical violations. As County Executive Laura, what do you plan to do to eliminate these violations and restore the public's trust and confidence in government officials? That is the crucial question. How do we restore trust in government? I have laid out very specific, concrete plans of how we do this. And I'll just give you some examples tonight. We've got to make sure that we hire people based on what they know and not who they know. All too often, people are hired for the wrong reasons. And they manage departments, they manage their budgets, they don't manage them well. And that's a big part of the reason why we're in the mess we're in. It's a culture of corruption, and it is time for it to end. So I promise, as county executive, when I hire people, when I appoint people to my administration, I will not allow them to contribute to my campaign or to raise money for any of my campaigns. I also won't allow them to hold leadership positions in any political party so that there is no question as to why they're there. They're there to do the job, and we want to hire the best and the brightest. We want to hire them for the right reasons. Another piece that I think is crucial and something I'm committed to doing is create what we call a doing business with list so that every vendor or contractor who does business with the county is severely limited in the amount that they can contribute to the campaigns of county officials, of elected officials. Again, so that there is no shadow of a doubt as to why they're being chosen. They're not chosen to reward, they're chosen because they're the right company for the job. We have an ethics board, believe it or not, we do have an ethics board in Nassau County. The five members of the ethics board serve at the pleasure of the county executive. I don't think that's right. I think it should be the minority and the majority and the controller who also have a say in who serves on that board. Again, so that they don't you know, get hired and let go at the pleasure of the county executive. I also believe we need an independent inspector general. Now, currently we have a commissioner of investigations. And this, per this person could be a fine person, but again, serves at the pleasure of the county executive, can be hired and fired by the county executive. So will this person have the nerve to go where the information leads him or her? I'm not sure. So whether you call it commissioner of investigation, whether you call it uh, inspector general, that body has to be independent and appointed by an independent body. And those are some ways, some very concrete ways 
that we can begin to restore trust to show that we're serious. I also think, I mean, I take a look at Supervisor Judy Bosworth. She started something called the Town Checkbook. Every check that's written to a vendor or contractor is online. It doesn't cost a lot of money. You throw it online, everyone can see it. There's no reason why we can't do that in the county. And I can't imagine that people will actually go online to look at this, but some might. And just to know that it's there, that there is accountability, I think will go a long way towards restoring trust. And if we want to tackle our big problems, if we're not trusted, we're not going to be successful. Jack, how are you going to eliminate these ethical violations and restore trust and confidence in Thank government you. officials? Thank you, and I appreciate that. Um, it is a very important issue. Obviously, um, there have been significant violations of the public trust by Democrats, by Republicans. Um, you know, we can sit here and point fingers at each other, and people can talk about, you know, Mangano, Skelos, and Vendito. We can also sit here and talk about Denenberg, Solages, Williams, Corbin, and Terry, and, you know, it doesn't get us anywhere. And so let's understand that uh, there have to be concrete steps. It starts with realizing that, yes, we have an ethics board, but for some reason, for some reason, um, they don't have resources. So you have five-member board, and they don't have staff. They don't have the ability to investigate. They don't have the ability to look at disclosure statements, look at procurement records. And so the checks and balances that you would expect normally, frankly, the checks and balances that I'm sure each and every village that's here today has in your own ethics code to have the kind of disclosure and oversight for you know, your public officials and those doing business with your municipalities doesn't exist at the county. You have a $3 billion budget, you have five members of, a, of an ethics board, and they don't have staff. They don't have a dedicated line in the budget. They don't have the ability to investigate when somebody files a complaint. They don't have the wherewithal to review disclosure statements and compare them with procurement records to determine whether or not there are any conflicts before there's a conflict to make sure that that doesn't become an issue. Checks and balances in law are critically important. And so, the, the commitment we have and the plan that I've put forth requires that these things take place because we need a board that is not only independent, but is accountable and is completely transparent. So we have to do everything above board. Every dollar that's spent in government, whether it's on a village level, a town level, or on a county level, is not our money. It's our collective money as taxpayers and everyone should have an absolute right to know how that money is spent. When it comes to contributions, I'd love to see, you know, a recommendation, perhaps a committee that would come in and actually reduce the incredible sums that people are able to contribute to elected officials, especially to county executives. The amounts of money that they bring in is, frankly, it's, it's, it's unheard of. And so, yes, let's reduce the amount of contributions that we're able to receive as elected officials because it shouldn't be that high. Let's also take a look at that list because I don't only want to limit people who are doing business with the county or the municipality, I want to limit those people who want to do business in the future with the municipality from being able to influence policymakers and elected officials. So that means a wholesale reduction in contribution limits so that we can remove the perception that something's wrong. And let's end nepotism once and for all in this county. Let's make a commitment that we're going to hire people not based on who their, who their family is, but based on, who, and based on what they know. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Laura, any additional comments? So I'm sure you all read with great interest the story on nepotism in the paper and the editorial today. And I actually signed a pledge, and I, I laughed, not with humor, but with, I guess with grim humor, that it's necessary to sign such a pledge. I signed a pledge that if elected county executive, I will not hire my family members, and I will not hire family members of party leaders, just to make it perfectly clear that this is not acceptable. This is not the proper use of your money or your constituents' money. Your money is not a jobs program for us. Simple as that. Thank you. Now we're going to talk about unfunded mandates. And as each year passes, the pressures, the real pressures on municipal governments mount with respect to pension and health care costs, and from other state unfunded mandates. Similarly, the county's mandated cost impact its ability to provide services to county residents, as we know. How would you, Jack, propose to address this serious problem with the state legislature to alleviate the budgetary pressures on local governments 
caused by unfunded mandates. Thank you. You know, the, the issue of, of this term certainly is not lost on anyone here in the room. Um, the challenges we have are uh, making sure that when a decision comes down from Albany that they pay for it. Um, I'm happy to say that as part of the delegation to Albany uh, just five years ago, we capped the increases in Medicaid spending by the county. Traditionally, 50% was spent by the federal government, 25% by the state, and 25% by the county. The state took on increases in Medicaid spending because those increases were um, outpacing inflation by a significant amount. So for the last nearly uh, four or five years, the state has taken on those res responsibilities where they haven't before. And so we have to look for opportunities to do just the same thing. When you talk about pension reform, frankly, the pension reform that we passed in the state uh, literally six years ago in 2011 and created Tier 6 allowed for the opportunity for relief. And yes, it takes time for that to happen because as new people are hired, um, those costs, they, their contributing costs as well as the cost to the municipality of their, of their uh, defined benefit plan goes down. But it takes time for that to happen. Obviously, we know that there are constitutional protections there as well. And so let's look for those opportunities. You know, when we t talk about you know, first responders, and we talk about the needs for our fire departments in the mandate that was sent down with things like the rope spill, requiring everybody be to be trained using ropes. We look at example after example, and we all know what those expenses were because it was our villages or our fire districts that had to absorb those expenses. When they come down with new mandates with regard to water and water control, it's our water departments and our villages and our districts that have to take those on as well. And so there has to be a dialogue between the county, the villages, the towns, and the state, because when those mandates do come down, and sometimes they are state mandates, and sometimes they are county mandates, and you have my commitment that, as county executive, there was not going to be a mandate that is passed on to our villages that isn't also part of a dialogue with those villages so that we can figure out how we're going to offset those expenses. We all have the same residents. We all work towards the same end. We have to work together and stop pushing the expense and the obligation downhill so that ultimately it's our local taxpayers that are taking on that responsibility. Thank you. Laura? So unfunded mandates in the county budget, the $3 billion budget, account for $400 million. So that's almost a sixth of our budget is for unfunded mandates. And sometimes our state legislators like the headline, and they like to say they've done this and they've done that, and they've you know, made this happen and that happen, but then yet you know, who, they kick it down to either the school districts, the villages, the county, to have to actually pay for it. And it's a mandate, so you have to do it. I remember serving on the school board in Baldwin, and you know, the school districts have many more unfunded mandates, I think, than, than the rest of us. Um, and the one bit of relief that we got was that we no longer had to celebrate Arbor Day. So, wow, what a relief that was. We have to talk very closely to our elected officials in Albany and make sure that, they, you know, it's great to get the headline and it's great to say that you're requiring this and you're requiring that. But if they're mandating it, I think there should, they should take some responsibility in paying for it as well. Thank you. Jack? Nope, thank you. Okay, very, very good. Let's talk about bipartisan cooperation, which lots of people like to talk about, but we all know it's very hard to see achieved. Villages exist to serve their residents, and most ignore political parties' policies. They do a good job of that, about ignoring their affiliations and opinions. What do you plan to do, Laura, to make our county legislators work together for the benefit of all of our county's residents? So I guess you haven't been to any legislative meetings recently. <laughs> it's, it drives me, I'm being probably a little too honest, it drives me crazy to see the fighting that goes on at the legislature. Everyone on that board is a good person. I know all 19 of them. I like them all personally. I don't know if these flies are as distracting to you as they are to us. <laughs> do you notice them? Yeah. Okay. Um, and I really do see myself I see all of us elected officials in public service. And so I have taken some tough votes right from the very start 
of my legislative career when I have been that one or two vote to vote with the other side. And I have been shunned at times from my party, and I have angered the leaders of my party when I thought that it was the right thing to do. And to me, you know, when it comes talking, whoever wins this election, we don't know which way the legislature is going to go. If Jack wins, he could have a Democratic majority. If I win, I could have a Republican majority. We don't know what's going to happen. So we have to start with a very basic level of respect. And I like to think, I could be wrong, I like to think that because I have been independent, that I do have a certain measure, a certain level of respect with the legislators on both sides of the aisle. That is something where we can start from, start with the level of respect. You know, my ideal, I think my ideal relationship is Tip O'Neill and Ronald Reagan. They fought like cats and dogs, diametrically opposed philosophically. But at the end of the day, these two Irishmen could sit down, have a glass of whiskey, and work it out. And guess what? They weren't talking about government shutdown when those two guys were in charge. That's something we need to get back to. Of course we're going to disagree. It's not North Korea. We're human beings. We're allowed to disagree. But let's start with a basic level of respect and then build from there. If you can sit down and have a conversation, you're way far ahead of the game. And all too often, on all levels of government, county included, those conversations are not happening as often as they need to. I see the role as county executive in a lot of ways as being chief diplomat, having the coffee, making the phone call, doing the meetings, making sure that you do the groundwork to build the relationships so that we can get the people's work accomplished without all of the drama. Thank you. Jack? Thank you. You know, um, and I know I'm, I'm, I'm speaking to the choir here, um, as mayors, um, that's our responsibility. You know, we have boards and we have to bring people together and we have to go out and deal with this is these issues that face us each and every day. Um, Again, I, I say again, it was probably the best 70 hour a week part-time job I ever had. Y you think about it, you know, you're stopped everywhere. Everywhere you are, whether you're in the park, whether you're in private time with your family, someone's gonna walk up to you and complain to you about something that's wrong. And you work with others to make sure that you address those issues. You know, whether it was in my time as a part-time mayor, whether it was as in my time as a part-time state senator, taking time and three days a week up in Albany. Um, the ability to work together and actually bring people together has always been part of what I do, but it's called leadership. It's called not sitting back and pointing fingers and complaining about the things that are happening around you. It's not about identifying those issues. Each and every one of us in this room can identify every issue that we've talked about here today. It's about taking action. It's about making a difference. It's about stepping in and providing that 13th vote that's necessary, not just because it involves a project for streetscape improvements in Baldwin in your own backyard, but also because it's important to Laura Schaefer that they pave Westbury Avenue and Carl Place because they deserve to have their roads paved and not play politics with that issue. It's about working together in a real sense and negotiating from a standpoint that we respect one another and we respect one another's opinion. I fully understand that I do not have all of the answers, but I do know where to get them. And oftentimes getting those answers means talking to someone who has an opposite view to mine. And I've done that in the past. Whether it's crafting legislation and making sure that we pass state laws that are required to take on things like the heroin epidemic, taking on workplace um, and, and domestic violence issues, taking on uh, workforce development issues. We've worked across the aisles, we've passed legislation, Republicans in the state Senate, Democrats in the assembly, and a Democratic governor, and we've made it happen. That doesn't happen here in Nassau County, and that's the shame of it. It hasn't happened in a long time. It didn't happen under this administration with this legislature and its members. It didn't happen under the prior administration. So it's not a Republican or a Democratic issue. We have to get beyond the partisanship and get back to actually working together. You know what that means. For the most part, all of our villages, our mayors and our trustees are elected on a nonpartisan basis. And they may disagree, but they always understand that they're doing the people's business. Thank you. So I'll just add, you know, there's the cliche, there's no Republican or Democratic way to fill a pothole. I think that's what, what the point is of this. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I would like to just tell you both that 
This is the last question of the evening. As the nation's first suburb, Nassau County was once one of the most attractive places in the nation to live. Now the cost of living and the deterioration of infrastructure and services has left Nassau County as an aging and less desirable place to live. What is your vision and top strategy to expand Nassau's tax base, create sustainable job growth, and reestablish the county as a place to do business, work, and raise a family? Jack? Thank you. Thank you. That is the challenge. That right there is the challenge for the next county executive because we all want the same thing. We want to make sure that we have, first of all, that we take care of the problems here in the county and we stop kicking that can down the road to make sure that we don't leave problems for our children to deal with, that we don't have the ability or the courage to deal with ourselves. So first, we have to fix our finances. We have to make sure that NIFA is a thing of the past and then we have to marshal our resources and make the necessary investments in infrastructure and go out there and create an environment that allows for manufacturing to come back and high-tech jobs. Now, how do you do that? You know, we understand where our strengths are here. Our strengths are both that we have a highly educated workforce, that we have great transportation network, although it needs infrastructure improvement as well, and that we have great research facilities and hospitals right here. We should be a place where you know, biopharma wants to come and invest. And yet, because of our financial difficulties, that hasn't happened. We have zero Fortune 500 companies that are based in Nassau County, zero. There are two in Suffolk, there are three in Westchester, there are 16 in northern New Jersey in the eight counties outside of New York City, but none in Nassau County. And I'll tell you because, because we've been under a control board for eight years, we've been under an oversight board for 17 years, and we haven't been able to get our own county in line. So let's fix our, fix our finances, and then let's use our economic development muscle, whether it's the IDA, whether it's CBDG grants, whether it's the monies that we have available, federal and state, and let's go out there and bring in the employers that we need to move forward. There's a sweepstakes taking place right now for Amazon, 50,000 jobs, $5 billion in infrastructure improvements. And Nassau County, if you look at it, should be able to check off all of the boxes that are necessary, a highly educated workforce, transportation, over a million people. All of those elements are there. And yet, where are we? And so we have to look at the hub and the ability of the hub to actually become an income generator and an economic generator for sales tax. We have to look at Belmont and the interesting opportunities that exist there. Obviously, bringing back the Islanders, creating a new arena there, creating synergies with a, na a, a nationwide or international brand, which is Belmont, and creating the economic opportunities that generate the sales tax that funds literally 40, 45 percent of the county's budget right now. And so it means thinking big again. It means going forward and being bold. And it means taking initiative and not just allowing things to happen because they've always happened that way. We've tiptoed through this for too long. Let's go out there and make it happen. Thank you. Laura? Thank you. So it's the tale of two, not cities, a tale of two developments. You look at the hub. And there have been plans to develop the hub to do housing, to make it a destination, to have retail, to really be a tax generator, an economic engine. And what happened? There was bickering. There was municipal bickering. There was partisan bickering. And career politicians basically escorted the islanders off the island. So you've got a redesigned, refurbished coliseum surrounded by 77 acres of concrete. Yes, Memorial Sloan Kettering is building there but we need a vision of what to do. It's right in the heart of our county, and it's, 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 it's just, I'm, I'm speechless that the fact that we're not maximizing our potential. I think of the years of tax generation that could have happened and didn't because of apathy, inertia, and bickering. But I am an optimist. There are visions for that site now, visions that I am very much looking forward to shepherding and seeing through as county executive so that we can reach our potential. I'd love to see some wide range of housing options there, make it a real destination, and really support the Coliseum that's there. It's very lonely looking. 
We've also got Belmont. We've got an excellent opportunity there. So I'm sure you know the state issued an RFP, three answered. They all look intriguing in their own way. Obviously, it's up to the state to decide what it is, but let's not blow it. What do we have to do? We have to make sure that whatever development is chosen, we get buy-in from the community. That's key. Dealing with traffic, dealing with congestion, dealing with what it is that they want, what it is that they don't want, et cetera. We've got to make sure that there's jobs created. You know, we talk about keeping young people here. That's key, creating jobs. And then third, we've got to make sure that it's a good deal for the taxpayers. So let's learn from our past mistakes. You know, if you don't learn from the past, you're doomed to repeat it. Let's learn from our mistakes and get it together. And finally, you know, we've got great ingredients. It's like a cake. You've got all the ingredients, but they're just not put together in the right way. Let's get it together so that we can finally be as good as the sum of our parts and live up to our potential. I have a lot of passion for this. I know we can do it. It's just going to take a lot of hard work and a lot of cooperation. Any other comments? No? Very, very good. I think we are at the time of the proceedings where we are going, going to hear from each one of you in closing. But I would just like to say this to you, that it's obvious to me and it has been my pleasure to listen to both of you and that both of you are so candid and frank and straightforward. But you agree on so much. You really do from my perspective. And you have agreed on how you would address many of the issues that face Nassau County. Could you tell us in your closing statements, I hope, how to distinguish between you and why we should vote for one of you and not your opponent? Jack Barnes, it's your turn. Okay, thank you. You know, um, I think this election comes down to experience. The opportunities that exist for change in this county um, have to be addressed on day one. It's not a question of wishing it. It's not a question of pointing at it. It's a question of actually having done it in the past. So when we look at the issues of the finances of the county and the ability to not only balance a budget, which I have done every year, whether as a mayor or as a state senator, whether it's dealing with the infrastructure needs and improvements that we need here in Nassau County and the opportunities that are there to actually not only rebuild, but rebuild to a 21st century standard. It means having done it, being able to point to that experience and say, I can do this because I have done it before. We have significant challenges, whether it's fixing our finances, repairing our broken assessment system, again, something that I have done before and done successfully, whether it's marshalling resources and going to Albany or to Washington to get the necessary buy-in to actually get the help we need to deal and tackle some of the issues that we have right before us. Those challenges that are there are things that I've done, whether it's my time as a mayor, whether it's my time in the Senate, and so there are things that I'm intimately familiar with. We have to deal with these issues on day one because as I've said before, we all want the same thing. We want to make sure that our county's best years are still ahead of us. You know, I had someone tell me recently that there is no way that you can balance this budget. There is no way that you will ever be able to get rid of NIFA because we are in a perpetual downward spiral in this county and no one can fix it. And I don't believe that. Because if we look at best practices, if we look at the challenges that we have before us and the way that we've handled these challenges in the past, there is no way that we can't handle this. It takes leadership. It takes people who have had executive leadership. It takes people who have made that commitment in the past to getting it done. And this isn't a, a criticism as much as it is an observation. Laura doesn't have that. And so as a person who's had a front row seat to years of mismanagement, it takes more than just being in the front row to understand that it's your responsibility to stand up and actually lead. And so wherever I've been, whether as a, a mayor in Mineola that moved a village from bankruptcy to a thriving village that won awards and served as an example, or whether as a state senator that worked with others to achieve the same thing, I've been able to do it, and I'm committed to doing it here in Nassau County as well. Thank you. Thank you. Laura Kern? Thanks. 
So my husband and I moved to Nassau County 20 years ago to the, to the month we closed in October of 1997. And we moved here for the Long Island Dream. A single family house, we have a really great elementary school in walking distance, the parks, the beaches, etc. And we knew that we would be paying high taxes, but it was part of a deal that we were willing to make. However, as a taxpayer and as a legislator, I am truly sickened when I see our tax dollars being, on squ uh, being squandered on a jobs program for the elected and the connected, on bloated contracts, and you know there is something wrong when Dean Skelos' son gets a you know, pretty lame job because of a county contract. So I'm running to fix this culture of corruption, to break it up, because the system is broken. It's your money, it's your constituents' money that's being wasted on this corruption, on this mismanagement, and on this dysfunction. And I would argue that I have the right experience. I also have the independence. Part-time, right? We're supposed to be a legislator, supposed to be a part-time job. I have delved deep into the departments. No, I know what's working, I know what's not working. I help my constituents navigate, I deliver for them, and I'm very proud of that. That's something that I want to amplify. I have been a true advocate. I serve a very diverse, very middle-class district. And I'm very proud that I am their advocate and that I have delivered for them. That's something that I want to amplify. I want to take it countywide. And I want to prove to you and to them that I am serious about restoring trust. That's why this campaign is about discussing and laying out very concrete ways that I will do that as county executive. And then we will all benefit. I want to thank you very much for your attention and remind everyone to vote on election day, whether it's me or Jack. I personally think it's me, but I'm biased. The more people vote, the more whoever wins will be held accountable. Maybe 30% of people will turn out for this election if we're lucky, maybe. There's no accountability there, or very little accountability. If you want a true voice in your government, make sure that you encourage people to vote for whomever their candidate is. And I thank you very much for this attention. And if I win, I very much look forward to working with the village officials here and who aren't here as well. Thank you. Mayor Kennedy, for some final remarks. Thank you. Thank you very much. You know, I want to thank our candidates, Judge Prudenci, and uh, our members of the NCVOA tonight. Please, let's give them a big hand. Thank you so much, Judge. I hope that the questions and answers delivered, answers delivered here today met with your expectations, and I thank all of you for joining, this, for joining us here today for this debate. Please don't forget to vote, and please um, keep in touch with all the mayors of your villages. We're working diligently for our residents who are here today. Thank you very much, and I'll turn this over. Our uh, directors, anything to say? No. Nope. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you, candidates. Thank you.